I'm the founder of a company called Inverse Path, which, you know, uh, since more than 10 years ago, we, um, we specialize in the fact that we always dealt with hardware as well as software, which, you know, 10 years ago, dealing with hardware wasn't a very, a very, you know, it was a very, very novel thing, while nowadays it's becoming more and more common. And this put us in a position to do many exotic kind of research. We were one of the very first ones to publish a car hacking talk, which didn't involve the CAN bus, but involved um, uh, sending traffic messages to the car by, back in 2007. Then we play with side channel attacks. Uh, attacking keystrokes with from the power line or using lasers, which was also kind of uh, before the Snowden leaks, before everybody realized what the NSA was doing. So that was kind of interesting. Uh, in 2011, we uh, hacked credit cards, which is always a very interesting uh, convergence between software and hardware. Uh, and um, you know, and later we did some other research. But very recently, we published the USB armory. So and these two last two presentations that we did are somehow going to interact with the talk that I'm going to make. But anyway, this is to say that we have this history of finding exotic attack vectors, and they always involve both software as well as hardware. So this is what we specialize in. And today, I mean, I mean this is the you know we're talking about Internet of Things, uh, and we're going to talk about avionics and to stress, you know, the point that safety critical components are also security critical components, which is a message that, like the talk that was done before by Eric, is, is trying to is trying to promote. And of course, cars and airplanes are the best example of this kind of of concerns. Um, so. You know, Eric, where's Eric? Where are you? There. So Eric likes to play with cars. You know, very little things. You're having fun with those. Now it's time to bring out the big boys, which are planes, right? I mean, I cannot think of a bigger thing in the Internet of Thing realm as, a, as an airplane. So, you know, I mean, your, your talk was very cute, but, you know, I think this is, this is where the stuff gets serious, right? You know, your little Hot Wheels cars, you know, making fun of you. Sorry, but anyway, I can think of anything bigger than an aircraft, which is actually in, in some fashion on the internet. So this is what we're talking uh, about. Uh, so who can recognize where this plane comes from? Stefano, you're an, an aviation nerd. Can you tell where this place is coming from? It's coming from in which sense? Where, where, what, what do you think of this plane? Is it a real plane or not? It is not an plane. Trivia. Okay, that's good. So this comes from the movie Flight Plan. Okay? Okay. Now I have an easier one. Where is this coming from? It's always a movie. A clue is in the name. <sighs> I thought I would give up prizes for this. This is from James Bond. This is from a James Bond movie from one of the James Bond movies. And this is actually based on a real plane, which is the actual plane, a Boeing 747, which sits on the, uh, if you guys uh, watch Top Gear, there's always a Boeing 747 on the racetrack, and this is actually a modified version of that. So these are two non-existing planes. And the reason why I put them here is because there's a disclaimer to this presentation, is that we work a lot with planes, but unfortunately, I cannot officially name anything that we work on. So this talk will be, uh, as generic as possible, and I try to give you as much detailed information as I can about certain aspects, but unfortunately, I cannot name specific things that we work on, because one of the issues about this industry, which I think everybody recognizes, even the people that work into this industry, is that there's a lot of intrinsic secrecy in what is being done. And one of the ideas about this talk is to explain to you the positive things that are being that are done under the curtains, which very rarely get the chance to be presented. You know, and this is the point of presenting you the two fake planes, other than giving prices, which no one won because you suck at movies. You don't know where these planes come from. You know, it's embarrassing. You know, anyway. So, safety critical industries like automotive and especially aviation, they trigger a very, very high degree of public attention to these kind of matters and to their potential security concerns, whether they're actually 
whether they have a real impact or not. So it is very easy to make a lot of buzz to have a lot of press about uh, these kind of issues. And at the same time, aviation security is extremely hard to approach, not, even, not only for non-experts, non but even for experts into the information security uh, arena. And there's a, very, there's a vast number of information available, especially on aviation, much more than automotive, because all of the certification processes and a lot of documents of the processes that are taking place and the evaluation and the uh, accidents and incidents report are actually online. But however, uh, it's very hard to find a comprehensive explanation on how all of the different components that integrate safety and security, they're glued uh, together. And this leads to a lot of security circuits, uh, to a lot of misinformation and bad press. And, and one of the things that I try with these kind of talks is to kind of clear uh, the air uh, on these kind of matters and to provide some real insights in actually the way these things are, are done. This is one example of a very, very bad uh, press about, uh, you know, aviation security. Uh, this, there was this headline a few years ago, cyber attack concerns raised over Boeing 787 chips back door. And the article, was covering a very nice, outstanding research about FPGA security. Truly excellent. I mean, don't get me wrong, it was really spot on. However, the way the article portrayed this research, uh, you know, said two experts have discovered a backdoor in a computer chip using military system and aircraft such as the Boeing 787 that could allow the chip to be taken over the, via the internet. So when you read something like this, what do you think? You think that someone can take over the internet a Boeing 787. And this is possibly the most inaccurate explanation that you could ever think of about what the actual problem was. Because the translation was that there's one specific component which has a JTA connection, which is never ever connected to the internet. So it's something that in most design, it's not even connected physically to anything. Uh, and yes, you could compromise certain secrets with you know, very specific attacks uh, if you would connect on that. So, and this is something that even if it's a very good research, which of course poses a lot of concerns when this chip is used in, in, in scenarios where you can get physical access to the device. In relation to the Boeing 787, they pose absolutely no risk. And you know, this is one of the issues that we have. It, security in these kind of components, it's very complex. And the evaluation is very complex and it takes a lot to actually put it in perspective. But not only, you know, uh, the press gets this wrong, but also uh, official bodies. So there was a, fairly recently, I think it was last year, uh, the US Government Accountability Office published um, a document, a very you know, long document, where they evaluated their cybersecurity risks on planes. And they had this sentence saying that according to the FAA and the experts we spoke to, IP networking may allow an attacker to gain remote access to avionic system and compromise them as shown in figure four. And this is figure four. So in this official report from a US government body, you have uh, this diagram which tells you that uh, the in-flight entertainment system, which is the, the thing where you watch the movies on, on a plane, it is connected through cyber security controls, which I don't even know what that means. I mean, I never heard of that, it's, but it's, it's fancy. It's a fancy name. They're connected to an Ethernet router, and there's a firewall, and then on the other side, we have avionics, and that's it. I mean, it's, you know, it's you know, this very, very simple diagram. And this is the aircraft diagram showing IP connectivity inside and outside the aircraft. Is it accurate? No, it can, I mean, this is completely incorrect. And the fact that this is present into an official do uh, document from a US government body, which was specifically written to discuss these concerns, shows the kind of uh, oversimplification and misinformation that, uh, you know, this kind of, of, of systems uh, get which doesn't help anybody on the offensive and the defensive side as well. And so the main message here is that there's always a worry that interaction between safety and security is not accounted for. Uh, and this is something which in certain industries, it, it is very true. Uh, safety is a traditional concern and security is only popping up very recently. And the interaction between these two elements is, is not fully integrated and understood. And this is, a, you know, is an issue. 
In aviation, I would say it's one of the few fields where uh, for longer than any other industry, uh, the, these two, the interaction between these two uh, concerns is, is being handled. Um, and the way it works that uh, you have, you know, as normally you have in, uh, in other areas, you have different trust domains and interconnections, and there's a, a almost obsessive uh, attention into checking the interconnection between these two uh, domains. So this is the way it works, uh, and which is more or less standardized. So you have four main domains in any aircraft. The first one, which is the most safety sensitive one, is the aircraft control domain, where the most sensitive equipment, which has a very high safety impact, is actually located. Um, one of the example of, of systems which are in this domain is the flight management system, which is a system uh, composed of actually not one, but three different uh, devices, which are implemented by three completely different manufacturers that they take flight management uh, decision. The reason for being free and the reason for being implemented by three different manufacturers is because of safety and to minimize the possibility of all three of them being from the same manufacturer to have a bug that would actually affect their operation. Uh, they don't want them to make the bad decision, a bad decision at the same time. Um, and this is domain in red, it's the most uh, safety sensitive domain. Then we have the airline information services domain. So the airline which operates the plane, it is considered a kind of an untrusted entity to the manufacturer of the plane. And I think this is very important. The operator of the plane is not considered a fully trusted entity. And in this domain, we have all kind of devices that are used for you know, storage of data, computing, routing, all kind of services which are not essential for uh, you know, the safety uh, of the plane. So it's a much less critical domain. Devices that are hosted in this domain, for example, is the electronic flight bag. So now, uh, there's this tendency of converting the uh, very heavy bags that pilots carry with all the information about an airport and the fly path that they're going to take to uh, a tablet, you know, let's say, you know, a laptop or, or whatever tablet. And uh, that, of course, is an electronic device which, to a certain extent, uh, connects to systems in order to get information from, and this is the domain that this device uh, belongs to. Also, airport surface communication link, which allows the airline to get information about the maintenance operations on the plane, those also belong into, into uh, this domain. A third domain is the passenger information and entertainment services domain, which I think is pretty obvious what it does. This is where your in-flight entertainment system sits. Uh, so any kind of entertainment service provided to the passenger or network service, such as internet connectivity, belongs to uh, this domain. So we have GSM, Wi-Fi, uh, and the IFE, which is the in-flight entertainment. Uh, and again, this is a further separate domain. And last but not least, so you know, like in BYOD, bring your own device. In aviation, it's called the passenger-owned devices domain. So if your phone is allowed to connect to the network, it doesn't belong into the passenger information entertainment system domain, but it belongs to its own domain. And the interaction between your phone and the other domains is, of course, uh, accounted for. And we can see down there that the ideal separation, which uh, everybody aims to, is to have, so this symbol here, we're going to get to that, it's a diode. It means that the exchange of information can only go from one direction. It's a unidirectional information exchange. So it can only go from this domain to this domain, and from this domain to this domain, and so on. It, information can, you know, the ideal scenario is that information can never travel back upwards. So if you are in this domain, you can only have access to whatever data this domain decides to give to it. Otherwise, the reverse path is not allowed. And this is the basis on, on the way everything is, you know, security is accounted for um, on an airplane. So how does this interact with uh, safety classification? So there's a standard software considerations in urban systems and equipment certification, which uh, classifies whether a specific piece of a component, whether classifies the impact of a complete failure of that component. 
and we are different levels, so if you have something which is classified as level A, it means that if it fails, the failure is catastrophic, multiple loss of life. If it's level B, the failure is hazardous, so you can have injury or death in the worst case, but contained and isolated, not multiple loss of life. Level C is major safety impact, so which means that all of the safety margins so on an airplane, there's never a single point of failure. Right? The concept of safety is that you have redundancies, you have procedures, you have systems which are, which are backed up and fail safe that will, will act if something fails. When you have a major safety impact, it means that your mar the margins provided by this fail safe, they are reduced. So it doesn't necessarily mean a direct safety impact that something is gonna, you know, it's gonna, it's not a catastrophic impact where, you know, you have certain uh, accident or incident, but it means that your margins are significant, significantly reduced. And this is considered major uh, safety impact. A minor, level D, it means that there's no significant effect to uh, safety margins. You have a reduction, so it's not that everything is in normal conditions, however, it's a minor effect. And level E, failure has no effect whatsoever. So it's a piece of equipment that it can, you know, fail as much as it wants to, but it will have absolutely zero effect. In parallel to this, most airlines, they also rate the commercial impact. So if there's something which, you know, has nothing to do with safety, but for some reason it will cause discomfort to passenger, it will, it will hurt the commercial aspect uh, of the operations. Uh, and this is also something that is, is, being, is, is being analyzed, you know, opposed to what was mentioned in automotive that maybe certain vendors, they do not realize the certain security incidents, even if they have, you know, maybe a marginal effect of their require very specific conditions to be, uh, to be exploited, they have a major you know, public you know, uh, perception problem. So, but in, in aviation, they also account for this. But you know, we're not going to mention this more, more than this. So when software is being designed for an aircraft, and believe me, there's a lot of software. I mean, a car has a lot of software, as it was correctly mentioned. A plane is even more software than a car. You know, it's like having, you know, you know a thousand little cars in an airplane because there are so many systems that uh, are, you know, play a role into actually having a plane fly nowadays. So software which is designed for a plane, it's usually associated with a design assurance level. And this classification, which could be DAL A, B, C, D, E, uh, it's always determined, determined from a safety assessment. Um, the interesting thing is that A classification can be assigned to an entire system, so we can have an entire component, like let's say the IFE, uh, on the plane, which is assigned to A classification, but we can also have subcomponents of this system which are assigned with a different classification. So you can have a device where it will all have a classification, let's say DAL C, but there might be one specific, let's say, board on this computer that can have a different classification. Uh, and the DAL classification plays a very important role, but is not the exclusive condition in defining security audit scope and the priority. So it's not that something which is let's say DAL D will never ever be audited, or even DAL E. It really depends on a lot of other consideration. But of course, uh, you know, everything that is gonna be A, B, C, D, it always gets audited. But you know, there, there are many factors. This is not the only factor that plays a role. Also in, you know, in, avi in avionics, aviation, since 1988, there's been, you know, uh, documents and, you know, it's been assessed that it's not feasible to analyze, to assess the number of kinds of software errors, if any, that may remain after the completion of system design, development, and test. So the goal of the assurance process in avionics is not to squash all of the possible bugs, because it is understood that there's simply too much code to, to do that. And this means that there's a lot of assurance process um, oriented into having a good security design, good fail-safes, and a lot of testing to account that when and if a bug is encountered, it has no impact. So this is the mindset. And there's a, a lot of theory in the assurance process, which is actually what drives the way things are designed and things are developed. And this also means that developing this system takes a very long time. 
You might have a system which performs a task that for any programmer developer seems trivial and that we could implement in, let's say, a week. It would take months or maybe years to have that integrated and fully tested on a plane because the assurance process is so exhaustive into making sure that things don't get wrong. And this doesn't directly relate to the quality of the code. I mean, you can have some code which is not great, but it doesn't matter because that code will be tested and it will be predictable. This is the way, this is the mindset of, of the way avionic security uh, works. And all of the interconnections between these domains, uh, they are designed, assured, and tested to be isolated and separated from each other. Uh, and when data is required to be exchanged, uh, these connections as, as unidirectional as possible. And if there are exceptions, when there are exceptions, those are focus of an extremely tight control to make sure that they perform exactly as intended from a safety and security perspective. So this is the, the core way of handling security in avionics. And again, this is the ideal separation. So there, are except, there can be exceptions to that. But however, those are a primary focus on the audits uh, that take place in the design assurance process. So what are typical security threats that you might get uh, on, uh, on these kind of systems? Well, you have software. And this software is shipped to manufacturers, and it is loaded, and sometimes, of course, is updated. So the whole process of delivering the software, loading the software, and maintaining the software is one of the primary goals of ensuring that nothing can go wrong in that step. Uh, and of course, on top of this, always consider that there are so many operational, you know, again, safety aspects that are being taken care of, but these things are also looked from a security perspective. Maintenance procedures uh, are also part of the scope because even if you might trust maintenance personnel, which usually aircraft manufacturers do not, so they always assume that it could be anybody, also their equipment could not be trusted. I mean, because it could be infected. So the security of laptops, of storage, of all of the peripherals which take place in the operation and in the maintenance of an airplane, if they're never ensured to be in a secure domain, in secure operation, they are considered not to be trusted. And this is a very important thing, which is also very different from the way automotive works. Because we know that a lot of the concerns in automotive come from diagnostic procedures and the way diagnostic ports are being exposed. The aircraft to ground connectivity, whether it happens at the airport or whether it happens in flight, you know, uh, satellite communication, Wi-Fi and so on is of course one of the primary, uh, attacking that is one of the primary threats. Uh, all the cabin links accessible to passengers, of course, it's one of the most obvious uh, things. Uh, and also, last but not least, also the processes which take place to producing, to manufacturing the plane, if they involved uh, industrial control systems or access control system, you know, also those are part of the scope, uh, of the big picture of, uh, you know, what avionic security consists of. This is uh, taken from a technical magazine published by Airbus, which provides even a wider scope than what we're talking about here, because of course, it accounts also from the infrastructure uh, that is responsible for managing uh, you know, all the communication, the routing, the signaling, the positioning you know, of the plane. And we can see how the physical security threats, which of course, uh, classically, are one of the first things that are being, uh, one of the primary concerns are, put in perspective with the information system threat vectors, right? It's funny to see that also aircraft theft is one of the issues which may happen. So somebody uh, steals an airplane, you know, I, I find it particularly interesting. It would be nice if you can pull that off. I mean, kudos to that. But anyway, and, uh, and you know, uh, and, and we can see how, you know, passenger Wi-Fi, satellite communication, I mean, it's almost, I mean, the severity is very different, but you can see there's a maybe more blue nowadays into this picture than red. You know, and blue is the information systems threat vectors. So very different cultures, very different mindsets, 
were very different threats, but all have been uh, somehow, you know, accepted as something that is, 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 is being handled for these kind of purposes. So what do we test practically when we get to do one of these tests? What do we encounter? So it is always different, right? It's not, it's never routine, but there are some typical components which we target. All kind of IO ports. Canvas is also something that is used on planes, so that also plays a role. USB, Ethernet, serial connections of all kind and, and, uh, and uh, flavors uh, are, of course, uh, one of the first major things that you encounter. Uh, wireless connectivity in the form, anything from Wi-Fi to cellular communication to satellite communication and also to more classical IP networking uh, uh, flows such as VPNs and so on, which uh, uh, are used to protect in part these systems. And then we have a little more exotic and maybe not known to the wide audience. We have multiplexers, we're going to explain what they are, and data dials, which can play a big role in securing certain interconnections between custom interlock. So a plane is made of thousands of systems belonging to different domain, and in some form or fashion, I mean, either they're isolated, but there's a lot of requirement for, for having to talk to each other. And there are a lot of physical requirements about the way you actually physically connect these systems and you route through them. So there are a lot of custom interlocks which take place, uh, which might have you know, security implications in certain designs. And one of the reasons we're particularly interested in this kind of test, and, and we work on these tests, is because um, from the knowledge of hardware testing, pretty soon comes the realization that you need to test all of the layers. So the Aussie model, you know, it's often used in, in, in network uh, security where we know we have the application layer, presentation layer. I mean, you, you test the payload of your application, you test the way the network works, you test the way your operating system handles the driver maybe uh, for, for whatever network connectivity you have. But there's also a, a, a vast amount of testing that here is done on the lowest possible layer, on, on the physical layer, or even before that. It's like layer minus one to figure even what physical layer you're going to have and how things are going to be connected. So usually the physical layer in this model represents, OK, you have Ethernet. You're going to have twisted pairs. And you're going to have a specific signaling. And that's going to be your physical layer. But in avionics, the expectation of what you see on a cable might change. You might have different physical layers that are going to be multiplexed on the same cable, for instance. So one of the first things that needs to happen when you approach an avionic system and you're presented with an IO port, it's not if you see, let's say, a USB port or an Ethernet port, maybe that's not always going to be an Ethernet port or a USB port. And maybe that port is not always going to be connected to the same host. There's more that can go on. You can have signal switches that act upon a certain condition. You can have more protocols which are being multiplexed on it. You can have conversion of signal. There could be an extender in between which changes your attack surface. And this is where it comes to. The attack surface is often not what it seems to be. And since it's a process where uh, you have to assure maximum safety and maximum security, uh, the test when you're presented with a port needs to begin with the lowest possible layers, even electrical. You know, what happens if I put, you know, a lot over voltage on that? I mean, that belongs more to safety. But from a security perspective, you have to apply the same mindset and start from the lowest possible layer. So what are multiplexers? So multiplexers are devices which apply generally, but not all the times, time division to converge, to, to relay different communication flows on one single cable from multiple entities. And it's called time division because maybe you have four devices that you're going to talk to that they need to talk to other four devices. And the protocol that you're using would re typically require four cables to be connected from each device. But you don't want to do that because you are on a plane and you want to save weight. Of course, saving weight is, you know, primary operational factor in developing airplanes and in operating airplanes. 
So what do you do? You use a single cable, and you take one packet from the first device, then you take the second packet from the second device, and you align them in different time slots, and you send them on the same cable. On the other hand, there's going to be a demultiplexer, which is going to apply the same rules of the multiplexer. It's going to know what the time slots are, and then it's going to take the first has, uh, slot and give it to device number one. Then it knows that after that, there's going to be packet for device number two, and so on. So this is multiplexing and demultiplexing. Um, extenders, so sometimes you, wanna, you might use a protocol in two systems which of which, you know, uh, and the cable for this protocol cannot be longer than certain amount, let's say 50 meters. But in, in putting, you know, in figuring out the layout of the plane, you realize that you actually need more length for the cable. So you either use repeaters or extenders, and these sometimes can also be multiplexers. All of these devices expand the attack surface of whatever you're transmitting. Uh, and in a non-subtle way, but at the same time in a way that can have a very uh, severe effect on the security of that communication. Signal switches. So a signal switch, uh, you know, switches is something that uh, upon whatever condition that you apply, it can be a very simple mechanical switch, it can be something digital which decides to activate the switch, can completely change one I.O. flow from one device to another and even change protocols. I mean, there are certain cables, certain ports where they can be reused for completely different purposes and completely different protocols uh, or even to invert the direction of that flow. And, you know, there are a lot of signal switches, uh, you know, or in states which uh, might allow that to happen. So one of the first things that we do in these audits is if it concerns uh, a custom uh, component uh, with the possibility for this kind of, of, of devices being present, we start from the electrical schematic. So we ask for the electrical schematic for the device and we audit the schematic. We try to fully understand exactly what goes on between the port that I'm connecting to and my final target, which maybe it's a dull B, dull C device, it doesn't matter. But what happens in between? Are there any other connections? Is there more, you know, than what it can seem to, to happen from the actual physical port? Um, and, uh, you know, and this, you know, if you search for FSA 9200A, you will find that these can be concerns even on, on mobile phones. Michael Osman did a very great, nice talk about explaining how the USB port on certain mobile phones can be multiplexed to a debugging port just by applying a certain condition on two terminals. So it's something that requires hardware, but of course it's something that completely subverts the role of your USB port on your phone. You're not talking to your main CPU anymore, but you're talking to another component which has more privileged access. And the same things can happen here, and this is uh, what also it's tested. Data diodes are, so a diode uh, um, is typically an electrical component which uh, ideally provides a unidirectional current flow. So it provides ideally infinite resistance in one direction and no resistance in the other direction. And a data diode uh, is the same concept. concept. You want to make sure that, let's say, you have Ethernet communication that between A and B, that the only thing can happen, that can happen is that A can talk to B and B can never talk to A. And this is not enforced by the operation and configuration of either A or B, but you have something in between which ensures that no matter even if A or B are misbehaving, the flow is always unidirectional. And there are a lot of data diodes on, on an aircraft which ensure this unidirectional flow. So if you have something like fiber optic network, it's easy. You just remove the transceiver which is responsible for sending on one side and receiving on the other side. Easy. On Ethernet, you can also do that on different levels, maybe at a cable level, or maybe even on the actual adapter itself. If you're designing a custom embedded system, you usually have two components, a Mac and a Phi, and they talk to each other for, and then they go to the cable. There are ways to set those up so that the connection is unidirectional. But there are also ways that, you know, those can be reconfigured to invert the direction flow. So 
uh, depending on how this is actually implemented, the expectation can be completely uh, subverted. So great care must be taken to avoid that the side which is less trusted or even the other side can completely change the direction flow at any given moment. And this is the kind of audits that, you know, audits typically start with this kind of consideration. Then they go further down in all the uh, other layers. And this is always a combination of pure electrical analysis and also firmware analysis to the devices which are actually enforcing this operation. Do they have a firmware? Can the firmware be upgraded by one of the two devices? If I upgrade the firmware, does the silicon give me the ability to change this kind of behavior? So what is the separation between the firmware that runs on a processor and, and the hardware which actually enforces a certain configuration? I mean, let's say that you have a chip, and the chip will tell you that those pins act in that way, and this chip has a firmware. What can your firmware do? Usually, these kind of uh, inner separation are not clear, but yet at the same time, you might have the ability of upgrade that firmware. And even if it's something which is not supported by the vendor, or even if you're using firmware that comes from the vendor, to, for absolute security and safety, it is important to address those questions. Because also, all of these uh, audits, they might take part, and they usually take part, in the actual certification process. And, and trust me, certification in, in aviation, it's a very, very serious business. So what are the tools that we use to um, you know, evaluate all of these kind of situations. I mean, we have standard tools, of course, uh, but given the interesting nature of the lowest layer, also a lot of non-standard tools are required for this kind of test. And this is a very common hacking goal and, and, and problem most of the times that traditionally hackers must overcome. When, they, when you have a device, let's say an Ethernet adapter or a USB device, where the hardware sometimes prevents you from fully exploring and manipulating what actually goes on the cable, you have a classic problem. That the attack surface that you can test with that device, it's only maybe 90% or even 95%. And usually when that happens, also whoever developed the system and whoever tested the system from an operational perspective has the same problem. And the question from a security perspective is, what happens if I can manipulate that 5%? And this is why often in this kind of system, we need to develop tools that allow us to gain that last 5%. Even if it's maybe a few bits or one byte, that's always the goal. And this has been a very traditional problem since the beginning of networking, when people wanted to inject raw frames and the drivers didn't allow them uh, to do. And of course, in modern hardware, it's a classic recurring uh, problem. Because you have to understand that there are so many layers involved in, in any single connection. Let's talk about USB. When you plug a USB device, there's so much more that goes on other than driver identification for that device. I mean, at the physical layer, uh, you have a physical controller which needs to figure out what are the initial requirements for that device and to understand if you have a USB hub, for instance, opposed to a specific device. Uh, so the whole enumeration process of USB devices at the very first phase, it mostly happens in hardware, but that's not necessarily the case for all implementations. So this hardware boundary that I place here between what happens fully in hardware and fully in software is kind of fluid, especially when you have to deal with a custom systems. Because does the hardware that stays here in the gray area, is it, again, full silicon or is there a firmware? Can that firmware be changed? So these are the questions that we have to think. And if I can change that, can I affect the security or the safety of my device? Uh, and again, the actual function of your USB device, whether it's you know, a mass storage or Ethernet card or whatever, only comes later when the actual software uh, gets to touch that. And even there, there can be a lot of problems which you can simply not trigger with certain USB devices or fuzzers that you have. 
Bluetooth is another example where you have so many layers. There's a control layer which traditionally is typically handled uh, in full in hardware, and then you have the managing of the link, which is another subcomponent of the hardware, but it is mostly done by firmware and by software. And then finally, with the host controller interface, you actually reach the driver in your OS. So typically, by manipulating, let's say you plug a, use, a Bluetooth dongle on your laptop and you change your user space software, you can probably test and fuzz these layers very easily. If you want to test this layer here, you have to go into the kernel driver. But if you want to test all the other layers, which maybe on your testing laptop are implemented full in hardware, and there's nothing you can do to affect them, but maybe in your target they're not, and maybe they have uh, security and safety criticality. So these are the kind of issues. And on Ethernet, I mean, Ethernet is a very commonly understood interface, right? But you have the same problem. I mean, uh, of course, you have your payload, and you have the actual data in the so-called Mac frame, which is done by your user application. The actual frame itself is generally done by the kernel, but it's also now easy to do that from an application perspective. But then you have the Mac packet, which is, includes some other additional signaling bits, which usually, it's not even what the driver control is. It's one component of the network car. It's a hardware component, which is, controls that, and you can never generally change that. You know? So these two layers here might be parsed by software, maybe running on an FPGA on the other side, but in your laptop, you have no way of changing those. And so the question comes, what happens if I change those? Can it trigger a security bug and so on? So what are the tools to overcome this, this kind of problem? So few examples that you know, are not fully custom that we can easily discuss. So for USB, now, you know, since USB is also present on any laptop and phone, uh, this is a more understood issue right now. And there are at least two tools. One is Face Tensor from Travis Goodspeed, which uh, can provide almost arbitrary emulation of devices at a certain speed. And then, I mean, I cannot not mention something that we've done, which is called the USB Armory, which is basically a computer in a form of a USB stick. And, and the characteristic of this specific CPU is that the amount of freedom that it allows you in changing all the USB layers is, is very, it, it, you know, it's very forgiving. You can do a lot of things that you cannot do on, on, on other chips. So for testing USB, uh, it, it makes uh, a fairly complete fuzzing and testing platform. For low-level Ethernet, there's another project that we've done. So there, there, there are links, and you can go on our website, and you will find them. They're all open source, of course. Um, it is kind of hard to find um, Ethernet devices that allow you to have these two sections here, so to have the Mac on a software level. So usually, the media access control is always hardware. This device here has a so-called soft Mac which means that you can upload a firmware to this device and have Mac completely run by software. What about Canvas? So Canvas, there's a lot of Canvas going on on a plane, but Canvas is of a fairly simple nature, and I would argue, but maybe Eric can correct me if I'm wrong, that there's only one piece of information in a packet that generally it is kind of hard to modify, which is the length. Usually. You have restrictions in the length which are imposed by the driver or the actual hardware. Or depending on the hardware that you have, you can fake the length. So you can apply a length which doesn't represent your actual packet. But sometimes we found that there are upper limits to that. But most of the times we see that whatever transceiver is going to receive those packets, even if you can mess with it at that level, usually it doesn't really have a security impact. I mean, the security impact comes way, you know, in the upper layer in the messages that you can send, because usually you can pretty much send everything, let's say, in automotive. In avionics, it's not like automotive. I mean, what you can send over the canvas, oops, it's generally always pretty tightly controlled. So the canvas, unlike a car, is not like this kind of intimate connection where you have access to this shared bus where a lot of things going on. In avionics, you have single purpose canvases, generally which only works for a very specific function, and there's very tight validation on what is being sent. Because sometimes it is assumed that those are untrusted. 
So, you know, very different mindset from what you can find in, in automotive. But nonetheless, sometimes you want to exceed what the library provides to you for a specific adapter. So that, there's also a link on one of the many available. I mean, there are many libraries for all different kinds of adapters. But for the one that we got and we use, the library that we had for the adapter didn't allow us the freedom that we wanted to in fuzzing and frame manipulation. So we developed our own. And this is fairly common. You will find many different libraries for many different kind of adapters from a lot of clever people that they built frameworks which are much more efficient uh, to integrate either your own fuzzer or your, or your own tools. So when you see our Canvas library on our site, again, open source, that wasn't driven by automotive research, but it was driven because of avionics testing. And then, of course, we also use it for automotive because we also do automotive. But it's interesting to understand, you know, uh, to realize that this bus is used, uh, all, generally associated to cars, is not always uh, used for cars. So I'll give you a couple of examples of systems that are you know, typically a, a nice target for audits. So the Airbus CIDS, the Cabin Communication Data System, I'm mentioning it here because it's an interesting uh, system which, so this system controls, displays cabins, functions for passenger and crew, so cabin lightning, cockpit announcements and signs, door status indication, emergency signals, they're all handled by uh, the CIDS. And there's one device called the director on the CIDS which is a nice example because, as I mentioned at the beginning, one of the boards on this device has a different classification from all of the other boards. So usually the boards on this device have a classification called C and D, but there's one board, which is smoke detect detector board, which is obviously related to smoke detection function. That is a different classification. So in this system, the interconnection between different components of the same computer, let's call it, they are audited also internally to understand what's the interaction between these two, this board with all of the others. And of course, this device also gets in-flight entertainment information, actually gives information to the in-flight entertainment. So there is a path between this device, which anyway all belong to the uh, passenger domain. Uh, and you can easily imagine that it's one of the primary targets for this kind of test. And when we talk about in-flight entertainment, of course, this is one of the first things that, you know, you sit on a plane and you have it in front of you. So, you know, it, it's a crowd favorite and the security of the in-flight entertainment is also something that's also fairly recently is often discussed uh, in the media. And you have to understand that because of the assurance process and the length that it takes and, and the kind of, all of the kind of concerns that we talk about, is that every time you need to change code on this kind of system, this process is very tightly controlled and it takes a long time to certify changes for these kind of processes. And this is the reason why your in-flight entertainment might run very old software, you know? So let me, there's a nice tweet from Marco Ivaldi. So, the, which I know, it's a friend, so no problems here. So this Airbus entertainment system uses a 14 years old version of Red Hat Linux. And you can see the comments, rock solid, stable, and secure. They should use unbreakable Linux. There's one which I very much, but then you have other people posting their own experience with the in-flight entertainment system crashing. I like this comment, at least it isn't a 14 years old version of Windows. <laughs> yeah, you know, at least it's not Windows. Right, so you know, the community goes crazy about all of these kind of things, and you get all these comments. And then you get, oh my God, I also have a USB port in front of me. What can I do with it? And blah blah blah. So you know, and it just goes on. And, you know, other people posting, oh, you know, and you know, the perception for that generally, security people tend to say, oh, it's pretty bad. But this is the thing, because of the way domains are set up, and because of you know the way things work, it really doesn't matter if it's running Linux 1.0. I mean, it matters more because maybe you're gonna get a crappy user experience because your movies are gonna be slow and of course, if the IFE crashes, it's not bad. But that has nothing to do with the actual security of the plane because this is the thing. Whatever systems are in that domain, typical audits assume that, that the entire domain is compromised. So I don't even have to worry about compromising the IFE. I don't care. When we test, 
I am the IFE, you know? Or maybe, maybe I even, I'm even being a system further down in the chain. So it, it really, really uh, doesn't matter. Um, there are some things, or some ports, opposed to the USB port on your, on your seat, which maybe do matter, such as maintenance ports, which can be you know, any kind of, of protocol nowadays. And again, as I mentioned before, the question arises there, can it be accessed by an untrusted party, or are the devices which are plugged to in untrusted or not? And in some cases, and I think this is an interesting piece of information, physical security also interacts with you know, information security. Because there might be something which maybe is not immediately accessible, but from a physical risk assessment, it can be, right? And so even those things which are not immediately exposed, but, you know, it is considered an acceptable risk that somebody maybe takes something apart and access them, whether it's a port or a cable, even those are, of course, tested. An example of this, so storage, I know, everybody's gonna, it's gonna cringe here, range from floppy drives. There are some, some systems where you can have floppy drives because legacy, uh, to USB, you know, and whatever other kind of, of devices. So this is a flight attendant panel. Can you see the port of interest here? It's here. So this is a USB port, so very likely to be subject of an audit, even if the domain of this device probably not that critical, and here we have three compact flash slots that are there. Also on this device here, there's a button which is emergency. Chances are very high that this, just the button and just the circuits which connects the button maybe has a different classification level than the rest of the system. Just to follow back on the example of that, it's not that the, the entire system is classified you know, to a certain classification, but you can have different things. So, one of the research that we did uh, for, you know, explaining what we do, we cover ports, I.O. ports, attacks on multiplexer, extender, and converters. We did a research called Pack and Impact, which was inspired by trying to crack ways to have these kind of devices mis misbehave. And the idea is that when you're sending some data, which is encapsulated into maybe a multiplexers, so time slot divided, or maybe there's an extender, so the protocol is completely different. The question happens, can I somehow have that data be detected as the other outer protocol which is being used? And this is the packet in packet research which actually use a custom injection on Ethernet, where you can have these nice tricks where you send the same IP packet multiple times, but you manage somehow that one of the times it is detected at the different alignment. So here we have a UDP packet which becomes a TCP packet. And this is a condition which is particularly interesting when you either have multiplexers or protocol converter or any kind of device which is susceptible to this attack and that has the chances of taking your data and somehow, you know, you can have, even if it's more than one condition that needs to happen, to be detected as something which maybe belongs to a completely different protocol or a completely different domain. So uh, this research in its own, it's a one hour presentation, but if you're interested into understanding the subtleties, the extent that these kind of tests can take, I suggest that you look into this research because it is confronted with these classic hacking problems where you have to maximize your attack surface and, 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 and your tools. So, one other important factor, which doesn't happen too much into information security testing, is that when we have the chance of being involved into design rather than testing, it's a rare opportunity, but it's extremely valuable. By making the right design choices in deciding what kind of technologies that you use, uh, let's say for storage or for network communication, there are some choices which greatly reduce the attack surface, even just by selecting the right hardware components for you know, implementing the same, the same protocol. And the chance for affecting the design always results in a dramatically different uh, security and in much easier testing. So it is something which happens, even if not as much as we would like to, 
in this in this in this kind of uh, systems, uh, but it, it's also something important, which has a direct effect on the assurance process and, and on the actual testing. So now you might ask, do we ever find issues? And if we find them, what's their severity? This is the answer. Nope. Sorry. We cannot tell anything about the process that we're doing. We can only talk about generic overview of the process that we have. And this is a problem on its own, right? That, you know, it's, you know, I wish there would be more communication being allowed. So that's two minutes. So how does the avionics security culture compare to automotive? And I, I think I mentioned that in, in, in many points. So regulations and assurance procedure, we th I think, are much more pervasive, much more mature, and they've been happening for much longer into aviation, especially when it relates to the in, in relation between safety and security and also, you know, IT systems. Um, automotive security is classically be oriented over theft of, of a car rather than all of the other nasty things that have been recently discussed. And also, when you deal with automotive security, usually you also have to assess the advantage that physical possession of a device, like an ECU or something you can take out of a car, gives you. Uh, if you have a telematics box in a car, of course you don't have the luxury of assuming that nobody can ever get it running and that nobody can jailbreak and tap that device in its right operational network. On a plane, of course, these are things which are, you know, attack vectors which, uh, you know, have a completely different, uh, you know, chance of, of happening. So in automotive, it is uh, the actual security of the hardware in, you know, attacker's hand uh, are, you know, play a bigger role. And, and regarding domain separation, I mean, we see that typically, not all, there are some notable exceptions, like Tesla, the separation is very different. I mean, in one side you have, you know, uh, ideal design of unidirectional data flow in different domains. On the other side, there's one box which sits on the two sides, you know, of, of one side, you know, you have all kind of remote connectivity, and on the other side, you're sitting on the canvas. Sometimes this box might have more than one CPU. Maybe there's a baseband processor, application processor, and then you have the core processor. But, you know, also the separation between those two is, is often very weak. So the mindset is completely different. And I feel that only very recently we're starting to see something like this apply to, 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 to automotive. Uh, so in conclusions, avionics testing takes a much greater role than what the common perception is. And I, I really hope that this talk can change that uh, a little bit. Of course, there are improvement. You know, there always can be, especially in participation and confrontation in, in the public security community. I think there should be much more information given out. But anyway, there's, you know, a lot of work that's been done uh, under the curtains. So I think I'm good with time, only seven minutes late. I thank you very much. And if you have any questions, maybe I can answer them. Maybe not. Who knows? Thank you very much.